In this episode of the RTS Podcast, we interrogate Dr. Mike Zordos of Florida Atlantic University on repping the Reds. Welcome back to the RTS Podcast. Today, uh, sitting in with us, we've got Dr. Mike Zordos. Uh, Dr. Zordos is an assistant professor of exercise science at Florida Atlantic University, and he's also been the main guy behind the, I'll call it the repopularization of DUP, the daily undulating periodization model. Um, he's also a carnivore, uh, as he'll happily tell you, and uh, he's an enemy of leg pressers and assistance workers everywhere. So, Dr. Zordos, thanks for hanging out with us today. Hey, Mike, happy, uh, happy to be here. Uh, I'm not sure what a leg press is, but if... Uh, <laughs> I, I call it the, uh, the raper kicker. Is it? I wrote that is term it? down here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to type it into the Google, and hopefully an image shows up, but... Uh, I'll see you by the end of the show if we can figure that out. I'd appreciate so, it. So in CrossFit, we talk about functional fitness, and about the only function for that would be to kick a rapist off of you. Oh, CrossFit's another <laughs> one I just wrote down. I'm going to put that into Google as well. Uh, keep these terms coming, though, fellas. <laughs> oh, oh, my God. <laughs> um, yeah, so shifting shifting gears a little bit uh just for people that don't know you uh do you want to tell us a little bit about about your background or is that um tied in closely with norse mythology well it's uh you know not too many uh not too many people know i guess the first thing that i would like to say is uh you know if you look deep enough you can find this and i apologize but uh i'm almost uh 6 years sober from endurance exercise um, <laughs> Ooh. It is true. I was I was young and confused once, and uh, you know I was in college and I experimented with things. So so my apologies for that. Um, but we've we've slowly but surely uh, got our way out of that. Um, but sure, uh, what'd you like me to do, Mike? Just kind of fill in a little bit about uh, uh, what I do. Well, you, well, you mentioned endurance exercise. What did what did you used to do? I thought it was. Uh, I'm not feeling well today. Can we reschedule? I. I I think I just, <laughs> um, sure. So uh, my background in terms of athletics and then getting into to powerlifting, I guess, is, uh, you know, I always, I always played soccer, and uh, I went to a small Division three school called Marietta College. It's in Ohio. And um, uh, I played soccer there for four seasons, and I uh, loved that. That was, that was great. And after that, after college, you know, I was still looking to be competitive, so I actually went on. And I my, continued my education at Salisbury University, and I was a graduate assistant strength and conditioning coach there. Uh, and during that time, uh, I actually, this is, this is the confusion, uh, I started to run marathons, and I actually ran five of them. And uh, although uh, I did that, I realized that I, I was wasting away and becoming a little person. Um, so I got out of that uh, very, uh, very advisable. So... Uh, I went on from there to uh, Florida State. I uh, started there in 2008, and I did my Ph.D. in exercise physiology, uh, where I conducted research mostly related to muscle physiology, uh, both animal and human research, and graduated there in the uh, spring of 2012, and then started at Florida Atlantic uh, at, in the fall of 2012, and I'm in my third year here as an assistant professor. And uh, our muscle physiology lab here focuses mainly on human research, and uh, we do a lot of stuff, uh, obviously, related to powerlifting. We actually have uh, three, three ER racks in our lab, I think four Alico bars, uh, a couple sets of Alico and Ivanko plates, and uh, that's great. So, you know, all kidding aside, I'm very fortunate to do what I do. I have wonderful colleagues, and uh, that's how I got here. So uh, my, my athletic background really went from team sports uh, to kind of uh, some concurrent training, a mix of both uh, aerobic and uh, powerlifting, and then... Uh, really in about 2010 transitioned into uh, just powerlifting focus, and my research has continued along those areas. So, so there's a rumor, Dr. Zordos, that uh, you like to squat a lot. Um, people say that. Um, <laughs> people say that. I like to think of myself more as someone uh, who is tied for the bench press world record, and what I mean by that is... I don't know about you guys, because not just anybody can do this, but uh, I rep the reds, and uh, what that means is, you know, one red on each side on the bench press, uh, I can rep them, and I know a lot of people can't, but the way I look at this is, um, you know, once upon a time, 
uh, Tommy Callahan got a D plus, and he said, you know, that's not a grade they like to give out a lot. And rep in the Reds is very similar. You know, not not that many people can do it. So um, if you rep more than the Reds, uh, you're confused because it's still just repping the Reds. And if you do that, it really just means you're trying too hard on your bench press. So uh, personally, I take the most pride in the fact that I am the co bench press world record holder. I'm glad. <laughs> I did. So, uh, so think, you and me I think, both, I guess, yeah. right? I, I'm, I also am a red repper. That's <laughs> excellent. You know, um, Mike, I, I do have to say after this, I think you should probably shut down the podcast. I don't know how, any, how anybody's going to top uh, repping the Reds. It's, uh, it's pretty Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is the equivalent of an interview with uh, uh, leaders of state and things, things along those yeah. lines. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> it's it's can I say one thing about repping the Reds? You know, it's it's one thing if you're just at your point, as many are, where you aren't strong enough to rep the Reds. But there's another thing if you are capable of repping the Reds and you actually deliberately choose not to rep the Reds. To illustrate, um, as some might know, Mr. Ben Esgro was in my lab. And when he came to our lab, he is an individual who is capable of repping the Reds. However... He was doing uh, about 102 and a half kilos, 225 pounds, and instead of repping the reds, he actually put two blues on each side, and that is one of the most tyrannical things I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man, you gotta you gotta use the big boy plates when you can, right? Yeah, That's... it was it was disrespectful to repers of the reds everywhere that he would use. <laughs> this. So I, I I don't I don't even need to. It's it's a rite of passage, is it not? Yeah. Do you understand this? Yeah, yeah. Well, sort of, a little bit. I mean, <laughs> let's let's think about this uh, in in relation to your squat, though. What your best meat squat is? Five hundred seven pounds. Five hundred seven. Yeah, two thirty. Actually, did that in uh, uh, the meet here that you and I competed in together. Yeah. So uh, I looked up what uh, what your Wilkes score would be uh, for a squat like that, and you really don't get as much credit as you probably should for your squat, but uh, you get as many Wilkes points for your squat as I do for my squat. So, um, yeah, you should get you should get more credit than than you do for your squat. Your, your bench, on the other hand, uh, well, <laughs> like we he's said, repping the Reds. Repping the red, right? That's right. But my bench, on the other hand, is again tied with your bench. So. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that, man. I didn't, I didn't know that, and uh, that's that's cool. I, I appreciate that. That is the the one thing that I am not terrible at. Um, so uh, so thanks for uh, thanks for throwing that in there. Um, the one thing that the one thing that uh, that you don't get enough credit for actually is, uh, you know, quick quick story. When Mike, when you came here, that was the 2013 Southeastern Regional Championships that we held here at. Florida Atlantic University, Rob Keller directed the meet as he does with the meets in Florida and did an excellent job. And, uh, you know, actually, uh, Lane Warner was here that day, and, and uh, it was a pretty small meet. Uh, but it was a lot of fun competing with you two guys. But, Mike, at that meet, you actually deadlifted 843. And that was such a small meet, I don't think many people were aware of it, let alone aware that you and Lane, you know, two elite lifters were both here that day. Um, but you deadlifted 843 with relative ease, and uh, I don't know if that video has really made the rounds much, and I know it wasn't a big meet, but uh, uh, that's always been one of the most impressive lifts that I've seen, probably the most impressive that I've seen in person. And, uh, I mean, in the, at that time, I think the 275 class, 125 class, uh, an 843 raw deadlift in a full meet um, in the USAPL, I don't know if people uh, – really knew about that lift or knew how impressive it was, but uh, I wish more people would have seen that lift because you, you really had a nice day that day. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. Uh, yeah, it was a, a PR lift for me. I was, of course, we're always happy with PRs, right? Here's the for, ridiculous for thing now. Mike, you've done, you've done 860-something in a local small meet, I think, right? Or was it 850? Uh, it was 850 in uh, uh, a meet in North Dakota that I did uh, one year. Um, 
Yeah, I've done, I think I did 860 in a suit in my garage once, but, I mean, that's just a garage lift, so you uh, go, those are what they are, I guess. You wear the long tie or the bow tie when you were in your suit? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, did, I did try. I tried really hard at one point to get a deadlift suit working for me. It just never really happened. Uh, it would pull me out of position so much that I really didn't deadlift more, and it was more unreliable. So I was, even when I was competing in gear, a lot of times uh, I, I would just pull in a singlet. And I know that's not super uncommon. A lot of people do that. But I would even write singlet on the front of it in chalk because I didn't, <laughs> didn't want anybody <laughs> to mistake it for something else. That's excellent. Yeah. So, um, Mike, let's, uh, let's talk about you a little bit, man. Um, so we were talking a little bit about, um, about your job and, and you working in the lab and, and doing real life, honest to God science. Um, what's some kind of cool stuff that you've been working on? Uh, anything that you care to, to share with us or talk about? Uh, sure. Yeah. You know, you know, first and foremost, I, I honestly have the coolest job in the world. You know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm in my office right now, but when I come in, I get to talk about these sorts of things and, you know, teach classes related to this. So it's, uh, it's quite a bit of fun for me. And, and I just have tremendous colleagues. Our department is, is uh, uh, just, a, just a great place. Um, but, you know, our research in the muscle physiology lab, actually, you know, I'm really fortunate. We have actually three labs that I'm able to work in. The, the muscle lab where I focus, but we also have an exercise biochemistry lab uh, where my colleague, Dr. Wong, he really heads that up. Uh, but I'm very fortunate that almost every study we do, uh, we're able to collect blood samples and analyze them in our biochemistry lab. And then our third lab, we're just starting an animal research lab. Uh, we're actually exercising and using a fish model, uh, which is pretty cool, uh, to look at muscle damage and cardiac damage uh, in response to a fish model. Um, but I guess since I've been here, um, we've developed studies uh, related to autoregulation, you know, as, as, uh, as you like to talk about, Mike, and as you've made, as you've made it uh, so popular and, and, uh, and, of course, warranted. Uh, we've developed uh, equated volume studies related to different models of undulating periodization. Um, we've looked at research in response to daily maximal training or daily 1RM training uh, for a little over a month uh, at a consecutive period of time. Uh, all of these studies have had uh, biomarker components or blood components. Um, we've looked at some stuff related to biomechanics, and we're conducting currently a concurrent training type of study, a uh, pretty novel concurrent training type of study with um, a steady state, longer duration cardio component versus a hit component versus just simply more lifting, uh, but all equated for time to look at the skeletal muscle responses um, in, relation to hypertrophy, in relation to hypertrophy and strength, of course, and so forth. So we're excited about all of that, um, you know, really the, the stuff that we did uh, looking at the, the 1 to 10 uh, RPE scale uh, is uh, um, quite a bit of fun for us. So uh, a lot of cool stuff hopefully coming out, and a lot of these manuscripts, you know, without going into too much depth, uh, they're either in review in journals now or being submitted really soon. Uh, we published a few papers earlier this year, but we're very excited about the next year uh, and all the work that we have coming out. Um, you know, my colleagues have gotten me interested a little bit in, uh, immunology and inflammation. Uh, so we did uh, publish a paper in that area and getting to look at, you know, some of these uh, responses and some of these mechanistic responses um, to, uh, to powerlifting type training. Also, we did do a study at a meet here um, looking at where we had a, a, a tendo unit on the bar and we looked at uh, velocity um, in relation to attempt selection during the meet. So we're, we're working on that uh, as well. So quite a bit that we've done and, and uh, hopefully quite a bit to come out soon, but it's, it's truly a lot of fun. Dang, man, no grass grows under your feet, I bet. But it's a lot of stuff that you guys have going on, and a lot of it is, I mean, it's really cool because you're an actual power lifter doing this stuff, so uh, we get, like, answers to the questions that are, that are interesting, you know. Uh, but, you know, I, I know from talking to you that it's, it's a lot more rigorous than just that. It's not just, uh, uh, you know, set up an experiment and give it a whirl, you know, that, that there's a lot of methodology that goes into what kind of questions are appropriate and, and not. 
you know, just uh, just by way of example, we discussed at one point like testing out the the track system and stuff like that, and and like after talking to you and figuring out like all the preliminary stuff that has to get done before we even get to that level, you know, that's it's really interesting to me, and I, I know after having that conversation, I got a lot of respect as far as um, the amount of effort and rigor that goes into to doing good science. But. Yeah, that's that's a. I have a great question on that on that very topic. Um, you know, Mike, Doctor Zordos, um, as as you kind of look around the internet, you you see a lot of people kind of you know, disparaging scientific studies, and, and obviously some of that is warranted, but how do you guys at FAU uh, develop a, a study? Is there some methodology you guys go by to ensure that it's as holistic as possible or it t touches on all of the right things to, to create as valid a, a result in, as you can? Yeah, you know, I'm really glad that you guys uh, brought this up. I'm actually furiously kind of writing down some notes here. Um, I think I'm looking at a picture of Jennifer Thompson repping the Reds right now. Uh, <laughs> uh, but let's just say she definitely reps the Reds. I don't definitely. think anyone doubts that she reps the Reds. This is, I'm going to quit lifting weights. This is, I'm, I'm demoralized right now. Uh, anyways, <laughs> you guys got uh, the, the pictures flashing on the screen. I also saw a picture of Arian a little bit ago. I, I don't know how that one got in there. Um, <laughs> Arian, what's up, dude? Um, anyways, so I'm glad you guys brought this up. Uh, I, I'm, like I said, I was writing down some notes here, so if you don't mind, can I just take a minute and kind of talk about, I hope this is beneficial for everybody listening, talk about kind of the scientific process, how we go about developing the study, and then kind of how to interpret some of this stuff, if that's, if that's cool with you guys, to kind of give a long-winded answer to the question now. Yeah, by yeah, all yeah, means. Definitely. Okay, cool. So first and foremost, the reason that I love science is that it's all about trying to answer a question. So if the answer that you get is completely different from your, from your hypothesis, then if it, that's great. If anything, that's that's even even cooler because then you get to figure out why. You know, whatever the answer is doesn't matter, right? The answer, you're just there to find it. And typically, if you do one study, you're not going to find the answer. You're just going to have enough information to then ask more questions. And that's really the coolest thing that I've been able to do uh, kind of in the scientific realm is realize every study we do honestly realize how little we know. So oftentimes in training, what I like to say is a research study kind of in this area will provide you with a concept. It will not provide you with an exact protocol. Essentially, you take a look at a study and you don't really take the exact training protocol and implement that. Rather, if you have a study that shows this type of periodization is superior to another type or, or whatever it might be, then you would take that concept, you know, let's say uh, uh, undulating versus no periodization or something like that. You would say, okay, more variation in training variables is better than less variation. And that's the concept. And then you would put that concept into practice. But there's so many more unanswered questions or so many practical applications about it that you don't necessarily get directly from the study. You kind of have to work them out in terms of, yes, your experience, but also maybe having to look at some other research and understanding, okay, I want more variation of training variables, but now do I put them into a volume block? Do I put them into an intensity block? What RPE do I want to work at? And just really so many more things uh, beyond that. So research in this area will give you a concept. And then it's up to us to take that concept and apply it. And I think what, what we do, we're in a very fortunate situation because, in my opinion, in this area of research, it also takes the, the individuals doing the research to be able to blend that, to have practical and scientific experience. So I take a lot of pride in what we do um, because we try to control for everything that we can. Uh, but in addition, we not only have the concepts, but since a lot of us are lifters, we're able to take the concept that the previous scientific research has given us, but 
devise a study that's also very practically effective for the subjects in the study. That way we're able to really try and get the best of both worlds, at least the, to the best of our ability. So I hope some of that makes sense. But, you know, when you go into a research study, here's kind of how it starts. You know, you, you have an idea, and in research you can't really go from point A to point C. You have to go from A to B, and then the next study will go to C, because you have to have a rationale. And, Mike, I talked about, a little bit about this in the classroom when we did our, our introduction to research one and two lectures, or evaluating research. Um, but you have to have a rationale. So when you read a research study, the most important part of that is the introduction, because the introduction is the rationale why. It will lay out for you um, kind of some background, and then what previous research has done, and then why your study is needed, what the purpose is, and what the hypothesis is. So if you have that rationale, what will usually happen is, you know, you might think of an idea, then you'll sit around with your colleagues or students, and you'll talk about that. And then it will take you another month or two to develop the concept. After you develop the concept, you will have to write what we call an IRB. This is a, inst IRB is Institutional Review Board. We'll write a protocol, uh, we'll, we'll write up the study and submit it to the university's IRB. It then has to be approved by the IRB for safety, uh, for ethical reasons, for, uh, let's say, just quality of science that they, they believe it has merit, it's novel, all that kind of stuff. Then they approve it. Once they approve it, you have to take time and recruit subjects. Um, then you have to start the study. Let's say it's an eight-week study and you need 20 subjects. Well, typically, that might take, I don't know, nine months to a year because not all 20 people, you don't have room for them to start in the laboratory at the same time. Uh, additionally, you have to find people that meet the criteria. You know, it's not just anybody. Let's say we have a criteria where somebody wants to, needs to squat one and a half times their body weight just to be in the study. Um, now, again, that's not an elite criteria, but a lot of people will say, you know, you don't even need to squat your body weight to be in a study, and they'll call them trained. So we pride ourselves on trying to get the highest uh, caliber of, of lifters that we can in a study. Um, but we'll recruit subjects, and then let's say we're able to start 10 at one time for an eight-week study. Well, let's say during that eight weeks, um, you know, three of them drop out. You know, two of them just don't want to make the commitment. One of them gets injured. Well, now we're down to seven. Uh, then we have to go through another eight, ten-week period where we start, you know, let's say seven more. Let's say five of those guys complete the study, um, something like that. So then it takes time, time, time. Um, so that could be nine months or a year before you complete the study, and then you have to run the statistics, maybe analyze blood samples, uh, write the manuscript, um, get it to your colleagues, submit it to a journal. So uh, anyways, I know that was a, a long response and there was a lot of stuff in there, but uh, it takes time. And if you do a study the right way, uh, it takes time. And, uh, you know, in science, there's only one way, and that's, that's the right way, meaning to do things objectively and honestly and to, to answer a question. And whatever the answer is, is, is awesome. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. Uh, your purpose isn't to get a certain answer. It's just to get whatever the results are, and then you go from there. Do you, do you find that you are often defending yourself from not just your, uh, the university review process, but also from other uh, prospective researchers and or charlatans out there that are trying to produce or be, basically be competitors in this? Um, no, I, I, uh, I don't think defending yourself, I think you know, the IRB, let's say at the university, it's not something where I view you're defending yourself. I, I think it's a pretty awesome thing because, you know, they will, they will bring up, if you submit a protocol, they will bring up a lot of good points. They will say, you know, maybe this is, you know, you want to take, you know, so many blood samples from an individual in a week. You know, you need to justify this. This is a lot of blood samples. Is this safe for them? Is this okay for them? Is this this? And then sometimes if they decide it's too much, you know, because there's a lot of experts from a lot of different fields on the IRB, you know, those points are very, very valid. So they will help make your study better. Um, you know, I never view it as, if you're doing things the right way, you know, you're never having to defend yourself uh, because you're, you're always, you know, you're doing things the right way. You're feeling good about, you know, what you're putting out there. And if uh, somebody, you know, sees results of, of a study and says, um, well, I do things this way, um, even though you found this, and, you know, I, I don't, I don't want to do that. I, I, don't, 
quite frankly, I don't really care. Um, you know, my job is to, you know, do science and to, to find out, you know, what's going on and to, to publish that information in, in peer-reviewed journals. If somebody is not interested in science and they want to do something completely different, that's good for them. I, I, it's of no relevance to my life. Um, so, you know, I wish them, I wish them well in whatever they're doing. Um, and it doesn't mean that that individual doesn't have any any knowledge or any um, you know kind of any insight into what they want to do. You know that's that's fine uh, because you know like I said we can only you know oftentimes in research when we create a study, it, like I said it gives us a concept and we have to make concessions for feasibility of the study. You know for example my dissertation we train three days per week. Um, with squat bench on the same day and then one day squat bench and deadlift on the same day. And while you need to do the lifts, um, you know, on the same day sometimes, you know, I've had some people that say, hey, I took the protocol right from your study and I did it. And they said it worked. I got stronger. And I said, well, I, I'm sure you did, you know, and the results were very much in line with what we found. Um, but I said to them, well, that's great. I said, you do realize that the reason I only had them train three days a week instead of six days per week is because I didn't want to be in the lab six days a week for 20 hours a day. I said I had to make concessions so I could graduate, you know, so we could complete the study. Um, so, and then, you know, in terms of, you know, there's always people reviewing your work. In terms of the peer review process, when you submit a paper to a journal, you know, of course there's flaws, but that's excellent because you get comments back, and oftentimes those comments are there to make your paper better. And if you, if you get a comment that you don't necessarily agree with, What's well, okay when you reply to the journal, you will state, you know, why um, you didn't make that change that the reviewer wanted. So, and then once a paper is published, you know, just because a paper gets past peer review, once it gets into a journal, especially in this area, in this quote evidence-based kind of time in powerlifting, bodybuilding, whatever it might be, you know, people are reading it, which is essentially another part of the review process. Because if it has a lot of flaws in it, people will see it, uh, which is good. You know, once it gets out there, people will still critique it. Uh, so I think, you know, the more people can see things, uh, the more that, you know, they'll be, they'll be held up for being good science or bad science uh, and so forth. So uh, anyways, I think I went a little, a little bit off there, but um, the, the more that stuff gets out there, uh, you know, the better it's going to be. The more people that see it, uh, the more it can be judged on its merits. And if the merits of something are good, it, it, it will hold up. Well, you mentioned... Uh kind of earlier on about people doing the exact protocol uh, from, from science or uh, something that they read in a research paper uh, or, or even doing the exact protocol that you uh, had in your dissertation. Um, I was wondering if maybe we could shift gears a little bit and if you might be able to give us the DUP. Um, Mike, man, you know, it's like sometimes you just don't get it. It's, it's, uh, it's, not, it's, not, it's not the DUP, it's the DUP, D-A. Um, look, if you did the, if you did the internet... Man, I'm so bad at pop culture. Look, <laughs> look, there's some things I have to talk to you about. Um, you just don't know the internet like I do. If you just go to the Google, and um, I am familiar with the Google, uh, you can type it in, you can go on the line, and if you go on the line, you can search for the DUP, and you will see it. So one of these days, you do the DUP before you go to the club. <laughs> I am going to test this out right now. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, you have the dumbbells in your car, right, for the parking lot? Yeah, you got, got to get your pump on. You know, I say things like, I say things like that sometimes in my, in my classes. Like, well, you know, because we live in South Florida. And uh, so, you know, we make jokes about the qualifications to walk onto the beach in South Florida. Uh, you know, of course, repping, repping the reps, uh, but, you know, that you have to have the dumbbells in your car. And there'll be, like, 30 kids in the class, and, like, let's say 25 of them, or even more, just will kind of laugh but not really know. There's, like, one or two dudes that just lose it, probably because they do this. But they just absolutely lose it when I give jokes like that, or uh, they say some, or somebody says something, and I say in class, well, I don't really know what you said because you don't have over a thousand forum posts on bodybuilding.com. And, you know, almost all the students don't know what I'm saying, but there's one guy that just, he loses it. He can't even focus the rest of the class. He thinks it's the greatest thing ever. <laughs> well, I would imagine at this point in your career, you're probably starting to 
attract uh, some grad students that maybe kind of have more of a background in, in that sort of thing? Uh, do you find that that's kind of being the case? Yeah. Are you getting more people that kind of want to um, come to FAU because, you know, they've heard of you and they've heard of the work that, to, that you do and they want to kind of be more involved with that kind of thing? You know, you know, Mike, I am. Um, it's, it's really cool sometimes to get emails and, you know, but it, people will say, oh, you know, I saw your work and I, I, are you taking students and so forth? And, you know, a lot of that, you know, I got to say, Mike, is really due to, you know, someone like yourself um, or someone like Lane who's been nice enough to, to you guys have put some of my stuff out there. So, um, you know, I, I don't think that I personally, um, you know, draw anybody or, or, or do anything that great. I think it's you guys that are nice enough to have me on shows like this that, uh, you know, kind of are able to somewhat get my name to some prospective students and they want to come here, which is, which is really cool. Uh, but, you know, on that, really two things. You know, one, I always, I always let prospective students know and current students know that, and I don't want this to sound like a negative, uh, you know, especially since uh, we're on a, a powerlifting type show, but I always let them know that we, we do not research powerlifting. Um, we do resistance training type studies that will have application for that. And, and certainly in a way, you know, we've done some stuff at a meet, but we do muscle physiology science and we do exercise biochemistry. So everybody that comes here uh, will gather skills not only doing resistance training studies, but also uh, in our biochemistry lab, you know, running ELISA kits for certain hormones, um, you know, doing cell culture, looking at RNA extraction, or getting in our animal laboratory. So, you know, we, we don't have a PhD program here yet. We have a master's program. So although I will attract some guys that, and, and girls that, that lift weights, um, you know, I don't want them specializing too much because I want them getting well-rounded science and exercise physiology. And so I try to, to really kind of drive that home to everybody is if you come here, certainly you will be involved in, in some of that stuff related to powerlifting, but that's not primarily what we do. Um, we do science as a whole related to exercise physiology, and we have such a tremendous faculty that I think locking students into that would be doing them a disservice because they wouldn't get uh, the immunology and the neurophysiology and the cardiac physiology uh, that the other faculty can bring them here. Um, and the, the biggest kind of thing that I look for when students come here is to just, to just be a good person. You know, my goal is to really take care of my students. And uh, if I can take care of them, uh, you know, I'm going to be in a good situation. You know, I really, I really learned that. There's a guy that a lot of people here won't know, but his name is uh, Dr. Lee Brown. And he's just one of the greatest strength and conditioning researchers of all time. He's at Cal State Fullerton. And, uh, you know, he says that he, he said, Mike, you know, just take care of your students. And if I take care of them, they'll work hard. We'll work hard. We'll publish papers. Um, they'll get into a PhD program. Uh, we'll continue to work together. Um, people will see that. I'll attract new students. Um, and it'll just be a, a tremendous relationship. So uh, if I can do that, things will, things will work out. But by doing that, hopefully, our goal is just to attract good people. You know, I can teach them lab skills. That's no problem. Um, but if you're a good person, you're going to do things the right way. Um, you know, it's, things are going to work out. And that's, that's really what we try to do here. And, you know, Mike, you've been here a little bit. And uh, the, the biggest thing I can say is, man, we have fun every day. Uh, we hang out in the lab. And as, as my wife says, she says, so, she says, so are you going to go play with your friends today? I say, uh, yeah, pretty much. And I said, no, it's, not, it's not my fault that you don't get to do that every day. Uh, but, uh, it's, it's pretty awesome. So, um, anyways, that's, uh, that's going on a little bit, but I just have the, the best students in the world. So I, uh, I'm sure a lot of people think that, uh, about their own students and they should, uh, but my guys are just tremendous. So, uh, without them, uh, I certainly wouldn't be on the show right now. Yeah. They, you do have a, a good group built up around you there. That's for sure. Yeah. Um, we probably should talk a little bit about like the lifting of weights. Um, oh. Although we've kind of been on the periphery of that, you know, most okay. of this most of this time. Um, I have a, I guess, just kind of by way of getting us started in that. What's kind of uh, how how would you describe your training philosophy? How would you kind of 
how would you describe some of like the core tenets uh, when it comes to training for powerlifting? Sure. So, you know, and and you know, I may I may be at fault for some of this, but um, the the core tenets of of how I would look at it are are pretty simple, and I I wouldn't overthink a lot of it, which is have an overall periodized design and do the main lifts. Don't train to failure. Over time, gradually look to increase volume, not doing a ton of volume immediately. Right? So periodized design, focus on the main lifts, um, do them frequently. Don't train to failure. If you're staying short of failure, you're creating less damage, meaning that you're able to train again. And if you can then train more frequently, that's also going to bring more volume. So it's not about a ton of volume in one day. It's about periodizing appropriately so you can keep your training frequency, thus practicing the skill more and achieving more volume over time and looking at things from a long-term perspective. Um, you know, you and I, Mike, have talked a lot about daily 1RM training and so forth, and, and I think that's fantastic. And we're doing research on it, and, I, and I'm certainly one that has done that. Uh, personally, my own training quite a, quite a bit. Um, but it's more to answer kind of a question. Um, the point isn't to do that all the time or even at all for some people. Um, so I look at things from a long-term progression. You know, if you just think logically and you say, okay, hey, I can add two and a half kilos to my lift every month. Well, think about over the course of a year, over the course of two years, how fantastic that's going to be for your progress. So I look at things from a gradual perspective. Um, don't get greedy. And uh, I, I know I've done this a lot with myself. And if you're, if you're going through your, your week and your RPs are a little higher than you want or on your plus set, your AMRAP set, you don't quite hit the numbers you want, there's nothing wrong with repeating that week rather than take, taking a jump in load for the next week that's not quite there yet. So, you know, we all do this. We all calculate out. We write a six-week, eight-week training block, whatever, and we calculate out the percentages and so forth and say, okay, so, wow, in, in, weeks, in week six, uh, this is what I'm going to be doing. Um, and then, of course, you complete two weeks of that training block, and you realize that's not going to happen. Um, so making things feasible, having an overall periodized design, progressing appropriately, doing the lifts, not training to failure. And then, of course, within that, we can get into, and I'm happy to, um, you know, the finer details of programming in terms of, you know, sets and reps and this and that. Um, but if you're doing those things, you're going to be fine. You're going to make progress and um, then you can, you know, kind of work on semantics from there. Uh, but that's why, you know, Mike, I think, you know, you and I and Matt Gary and, and so forth, we, we uh, get along and like to talk about training so much is, you know, certainly we have some of the differences on, on a micro level. And uh, that's, that's a good thing because we're able to, to learn from each other. Well, I mean, you're able to, to learn from me. But um, <laughs> we're, able, we're able to learn from each other. But as a whole, we all abide by those tenets. And um, I, think that's, I, I think those are the overarching principles. There's semantics that can be debated. You know, and there's semantics that, you know, none of us can really know for sure. Um, but I think those main principles are, uh, are in place. Yeah, and I mean, first of all, I think it, it probably goes completely without saying for this audience at least that, you know, the principles that I follow are very much in line with what you just described. Um, I would say that one of the hardest things to do as a lifter is to keep that long-term view. It's really easy to get in a rush over this. You know, it's really easy to start feeling like, you know, well, I've got a PR now, and, and really... I don't know what we're in such a hurry for because most of us that do this do it just because we enjoy it and we plan to do it for a really, really long time. You know, so, I mean, I get caught up in it too, though, and at this point I've written some articles and talked a little bit about uh, my year last year and kind of uh, it kind of serves as a cautionary tale a little bit about what can happen when you uh, um, kind of overstep uh, and let that um, – impatience for progress kind of rule your decision making and and lead you into some poor decisions so uh, yeah I just kind of wanted to reiterate that that having a long-term view of things is really difficult but it's also really important and yeah. like some of the best coaches that I know will willingly hold athletes back uh, just just in the interest of making sure that they don't get injured 
Now, we can debate on whether or not that's a good thing or a bad thing, uh, whether that's necessary or not, but um, I think the, the attention to an athlete's health and making sure that you're avoiding injury is is crucial to having a long-term view of things. And it's and that long-term view is crucial to long-term progress. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I think stuff like that is is really valuable. I mean, it's not nearly as sexy as telling somebody to, uh, you know, to do whatever, uh, whatever difficult sounding or hardcore sounding program you can think of. But um, I think it's probably it probably makes a bigger impact uh, in the in the long term. Mike, I, you know, I, you know, I agree wholeheartedly on that. And, and I was just taking a few notes um, just along those same lines. You know. Um, as you said, you know, one of the hardest things to do is to kind of hold yourself back in that way. But I look at it as discipline or, you know, part of hard work and, and is not always saying, hey, I'm going to go in and crush it today. You know, I think that, that sounds kind of ridiculous. Uh, part of hard work is knowing when you need to, uh, you know, delay things a week or when you need to taper that week or when you need to be cautious of an injury uh, or when you know you're not going to quite hit your numbers that day and maybe having a flexible type of template or auto-regulated uh, type of template. And it's, it's a much harder thing to do that, um, you know, than it is to not do that. It's like, you know, going in and not hitting your numbers that day. Let's say you hit a huge PR the week before, and then you go in the next week and you don't quite hit your numbers, and then, you know, you're, you're miserable for the rest of the night. Well, you didn't lose 40 pounds of strength in a week. For whatever reason, that just happened that day. No, no worries. You will be fine. So maybe it's just a sign that it's time to taper, uh, and then you will come out of that. If you know that you probably shouldn't take a 5-kilo load increase from one week to the next, then don't take it. Uh, if you back off that one week and, and stay where you were the previous week, it will come. So I just look at things of, you know, how many times if, if people go from year to year, and you might say, hey, your lifts didn't increase. Well, it's not because you, you couldn't have done it. You probably got greedy at some point, and things went backwards for you, you know, the increases tend to come in chunks, whereas you'll go through one or two training blocks and you'll get a big increase. And then let's say for the rest of the year you're kind of stagnant or you're fighting to stay there. Well, think about it. If you maybe programmed a little more appropriately previously, you might not have got a huge increase, but you might have got a gradual increase over time. So I look at things from a year-to-year -year perspective. Where I am a month from now is one thing, but where I am for a year from now or two years from now, in my opinion, is more important because it means I'm progressing appropriately. But you know, I, I just had, for example, I just had a lifter. Um, we just finished our first week, six weeks together, and, and she did a tremendous job. We started on her squat with a starting max of 82.5 kilograms. And at the end of six weeks, she maxed um, uh, 110. So 110 is 242 pounds. Uh, 82.5, I believe, is 181 pounds. Um, so it's a pretty substantial 60-pound or so increase in six weeks. And it was a little over where I thought, based upon where her starting status was. I actually dropped her volume below what I normally would, uh, but she responded really well. So when it came time to put out her, her new uh, block for her yesterday, um, and again, she started at 82.5 and, and went to 110, I only put her working max for the new block at 100. Um, so not at 110, actually substantially lower. The reason being, if I were to move from 82.5 to 110, even though she's strong enough, the increases in absolute volume would have been completely inappropriate. It's just not necessary. And she's going to be able to make progress at the lower 1RM, meaning the percentages she works off of the absolute numbers will be lower without going up to that 110 max and probably being unfeasible. So I just don't want to take a jump in volume uh, too much too soon in the interest of progressing appropriately. And to be honest, I probably could have gone a little under um, 100 as her starting max for this block. Um, so with such a, such a substantial change, I don't want to do that to volume. And, and the last thing is, you know, everything, everything serves its purpose, guys. You know, a lot of times people will say, oh, man, I went through this training block and I didn't gain any strength. I, I wish I didn't do that or I wish I didn't do this. I, I never say that because if I do something and it doesn't work out well for me, well, that serves its purpose. And this really pretty much goes for anything in life you are able to draw from that conclusion uh, going forward. So, you know, if we are kind of seeing the light on training, then we only are seeing that light for a reason. 
likely at one point we weren't, or we were confused, or we were doing things that weren't necessarily appropriate, and we learned from that, and now we're here. And hopefully, in another year or two years, we're at a better place because we've learned from some of the mistakes we're making now, and we're all making mistakes now. So uh, I, I think everything serves its purpose. So in light of trying to be disciplined, we have to realize we only got there from making those mistakes. So, so that's a great, like, awesome, just, you guys, like, I, I feel like I'm sitting here just getting stronger, like, through osmosis through the Internet. Except, um, except for me, because I was, <laughs> I, was, I was only referring to Mike. Um, I don't, I don't, I mean, I was born repping the Reds. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he, does, he doesn't have to work for this. Have you seen those legs? <laughs> I got a few. I got a few Mike T quotes that he said to me to maybe tell later. Uh oh. Um. Crap. Uh oh. Did you get cut off? Uh, yeah, I lost you guys for for a minute. You guys still there? Oh, we can yeah. That post. There, you're back. Okay. So that might be a great uh, time to, to kind of shift gears and wrap things up, uh, talk about the Florida seminar real quick. Sure. Yeah. So uh, I'm sure that you and I could kind of go on talking about this stuff all day, and I fully intend to. Um, I'm, everyone listening to these podcasts has heard us talk about, at this point, the Florida seminar that's coming up. Uh, we're going to be in Fort Lauderdale. Um, all three of us, and also Matt and Susie, Gary and Ben Escrow, we're all going to come down to Fort Lauderdale for a seminar on May 1st through the 3rd. And that's just going to be awesome. Like, there's going to be a lot of kind of the more informal hanging out stuff that, that you kind of see here a little bit. Uh, and to me, um, that's always where there's a lot of information to be gained and a lot of um, – kind of a way of thinking about problems, but we're also going to do the um, the more direct stuff too, a lot of presentations, uh, hands-on training sessions and stuff like that where we'll kind of deliver the, the nuts and bolts and the, the more actionable information uh, that stuff is going to be available too. Um, you really uh, owe it to yourself to go check out the full schedule, and we'll post the link up for that one. Um, check out the full schedule. It's going to be, like I said, May 1st through the 3rd, in Fort Lauderdale, uh, it's going to be it's going to be awesome. We're really looking forward to it, just because it's a lot of fun to do these things. Uh, but then also, it's it's a lot of fun to meet other lifters, hang out with them. Uh, you know, we all get to train together and develop as lifters and coaches and stuff like that together as well. So uh, it's hard to beat that stuff. It's a really good time. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, with that, uh, we're gonna we're gonna let you guys get out of here. I know that we all have places to to go and, and weights to lift. So, um, Mike, thanks for hanging out with us, and we plan to have you on uh, a lot more of these as long as we can uh, get it in the schedule. So we'll talk a lot more about training and science and, and repping the reds and what, whatever else we can figure out. Uh, but thanks again for hanging out with us, and, uh, yeah, we'll do this again. Step step one, find some red discs. Step two, put them on the bar. Step three, lay down on the bench and take a nap. <laughs> hey, thanks, guys. I really, all kidding aside, I really do appreciate it, uh, uh, Mike and Adam. It's very cool for me. So uh, certainly my respect for, for you, Mike, and, and, and is enormous, and you've afforded me a lot of opportunities. So thanks, man, and I look forward to uh, next time.